Hi there, my name is Leslie Duffy and I'm a retired horticulturist and I've been growing ferns for over 38 years. Uh, I love my ferns very much and I hope to share a lot of that enthusiasm for ferns in your garden uh, with you today. I do want to let you know that this is only the second time I'm doing a webinar. Uh, it's a little awkward for me to be speaking to a computer and not an audience, so please bear with me and I will try to make this a very enjoyable program. Ferns abundantly cover the woodland floor, yet so often we overlook their beauty and their diversity. We neglect the opportunity to use these plants in our own landscape, yet ferns make a beautiful addition to our garden space and even provide habitat for wildlife. Their texture can be unique and surprising. Their color can highlight other garden plants or make They are a contrast to other plants and provide interest with their color, texture, and form. Their greenness can be a visual rest in the garden full of flowering plants, or it can be a thread tying other gardens' areas together. Ferns can be used as specimens or something outstanding in the garden. Or they can be used in mass plantings that soften edges uh, in troublesome garden areas to transition between gardens and to provide a background palette for your garden. Since we'll be spending some time talking about ferns, I want to talk a little bit about fern terminology. I find that this helps people to understand the ferns a little bit better, and it also provides uh, some information for you as we're talking about the plants during the lecture. The frond is the whole leaf from the very tip down to the, the base where it arises from the rhizome. The blade is the expanded portion of the leaf, and the stipe is the stalk below the blade. The rachis is the stalk along where the pinna attach. A pinna is a leaflet or a primary division of the blade. And a pinnule is a subleaflet or a little part of the, the leaflet itself. Ferns arise from a rhizome, which also has a root and that, of course, is how they draw up nutrients from the soil. And a fiddlehead, or crozier, is the unfurling frond. Ferns also have different kinds of growth habits. Long creeping ferns have a long distance between the location where the frond arises from the rhizome. These ferns move quickly through the soil and will typically have more than one inch between where each frond is arising on, on the rhizome. Short creeping ferns are usually formed dense clusters of ferns that form rosettes are considered to have a vertical rhizome. Uh, they appear more vase shaped. Uh, and will spread, cut, make, spread and form colonies over time. They appear more as individual plants, uh, yet colonies of these plants will arise uh, and you'll have many plants in an area. There are ferns for every location in the garden and in the landscape. Uh, ferns grow in full sun and deep shades. Ferns tolerate a wide range of soil and can be found in all habitats. Ferns should not be looked at as special or specialty plants. They are worthy perennials just like many perennials, we, shrubs, or trees that you strive to fit into your garden spaces and landscapes. Most ferns prefer an average garden soil or one with some added humus. 
Certain species will tolerate well-drained, dry soil, while others grow in wet locations. We should not think of ferns as being fussy or difficult. Uh, they adapt very well in many garden locations. Most ferns thrive in shaded or semi-shaded areas, but some will love to grow in full sun. Many native plants, perennials, shrubs, and trees tolerate a wide range of soil moisture and sunlight in garden settings, and ferns are no exceptions. It's my hope today that you will learn more about our native ferns, and you will see that they are easy to grow and can fit in a wide range of spaces. As landscape architects, landscapers, native plant enthusiasts, and gardeners, we need to start using more ferns and start asking our nurseries and plant suppliers to provide these plants for us. We are limited to using only a few species of ferns because only a few species are offered. As we ask for more diverse um, fern plants, we will find that our nurseries will begin to provide them for us. Ferns are just as tough as garden plants and they deserve a place in our design. So I'd like to talk about ferns for different settings. Um, sometimes people find this a little bit challenging because I'm talking specifically about specific plants uh, and giving you a long plant list. But I hope that I can show you that there's a number of plants for different settings and you will find some of these species to be very, um, very interesting for your garden. Uh, the first plant I'd like to talk about is, well, first I'd like to talk about plants for sun. Uh, the hairy lip fern, uh, or Chylanthes linosa, is a great plant for the sunny rock garden kinds of settings. Um, it has a terrible name, hairy lip fern. Um, this is probably not something that you want to share with all of your friends and, and uh, co-gardeners, uh, but yet this plant is really quite beautiful in the garden. It's a low-growing species, only reaching a height of about eight inches, uh, and it has, but it's got these beautiful black stalks or um, stems, and the penny are grayish because they're covered with fine hairs. You can see that up close in this picture. Uh, there's a fine covering of hairs all over this plant. This makes the plant a little bit more tolerant of living in sunny or more exposed areas. The hairs will protect the plant from drying winds or uh, bright sunlight by deflecting some of that, uh, those incoming sun rays or, or the winds. Um, this fern does very well in dry soils and, and open areas uh, because of this. Chylanthes is also a species that has evolved in the southwest, so it does make them tolerant of drier conditions. The plant is actually capable of shriveling up, uh, curling up all of its little pinna, uh, so that they look dead, but as soon as we get a rainstorm or some water, the plant will revive uh, and un unfurl again. Another plant for sunny conditions, and I actually have the blunt lobe woodsia and the hairy lip fern growing together in, my, in one garden, uh, is this woodsia obtusa. This plant has green stalks, uh, it's a more upright grower. It does tend to get a little bit taller, but again, very tolerant of full sun and uh, sandy or drier soils uh, where it will really thrive. Uh, this plant is quite the contrast to the Chylanthes. Uh, Woodsia is an easy plant to grow. Uh, you can see it's got a short creeping rhizome. It spreads in colonies, uh, but does not spread aggressively. Um, I love these two ferns. They're quite a contrast to one another, and both of them look great in a rock garden kind of setting. Rusty woodsia is a species that we find quite commonly in the central part of the state. Uh, this is pretty common on Mount Tom. This plant will tolerate full sun, but also grows in shaded locations. Uh, the plant is called rusty woodsia because the spore cases or sori on the back of the uh, fronds are a rust color. Uh, it can also be covered with rust colored scales at the base of the stipe or stem, uh, but those are not visible in this picture. Another great plant for the rock garden, 
uh, full sun to full shade, uh, really thriving in sunny locations, yet tolerating the shaded locations as well. It does prefer a more gravelly soil, uh, a soil that tends to dry out more quickly, uh, yet grows very, uh, you know, so it will grow very well in your rock garden. This is one of my favorite ferns, uh, Palea atropurpurea, or purple cliff brake. Uh, it gets its name because its stipe and uh, rachis are a deep purple, purpley black color. The, the pinna are this beautiful uh, silvery gray green color. It's a very interesting looking plant. This is another species that does quite well in full sun. And you can see that it grows in rock crevices, so it really tolerates very rough conditions. Um, I've had this plant growing in soil between rocks, uh, where it really will thrive, uh, but it loves to sort of creep upon rocks, uh, getting its moisture from the mosses that are growing around it. Uh, this is a great accent plant for your rock garden, uh, and something that will really draw attention to your plantings. Hey, scented fern is a wonderful plant for difficult situations. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with this species because it grows so aggressively. This plant will grow in full sun. It has a beautiful yellow fall color when it's in a sunny location, yet it's quite aggressive on the landscape, as you can see from this picture. Uh, this picture was taken underneath uh, white cedar. The plant is growing extremely well in this area. Uh, and in a very dense shade location, uh, it will tolerate that shade and will fill in and create a nice understory covering. I've also used this plant underneath maple trees where you tend to get very dense surficial roots from the tree and the water levels are quite low. It's hard to establish um, many perennials underneath a, an old maple tree which has a, a very thick surface root mat. Uh, the hay scented fern will do very well in these tough conditions. Uh, you know, if you've got a large maple tree and you can't grow any lawn underneath it, uh, use hay scented fern. This is a great opportunity to use a fast spreading, aggressive species in an area where you might have difficulty getting other plants established. Uh, that's why I don't like this plant, is because it is very aggressive. This is not a garden species, not something that you would want to plant among your wildflowers. Uh, where you want your wildflowers to throw, thrive. Uh, Hay-scented fern, Densstadia punctilobula, is also an allelopathic species, meaning that it exudes chemicals from its roots and will discourage other, other plant species from thriving in the area. Uh, you can see it's forming a mass colony here. So be careful where you plant this species. Yet I think that you can use it very well uh, in difficult settings. Although this plant is shown in a shaded situation, uh, sensitive fern or Anaclea sensibilis does quite well in a sunny location. This is another fern that can tend to be a little bit aggressive. Um, it's great for a wet meadow where you want a plant that will, will spread and thrive among uh, grasses and wildflowers in a wet setting. Uh, it prefers to be in a moist soil, but it tolerates an average garden soil. Um, knowing that it tolerates a wide range of soils can also indicate that it does tend to be a little bit more aggressive than some of our other species. Yet the sensitive fern has a separate uh, ve vegetative and fertile fronds. Uh, the fertile fronds come up and look sort of like a, a rattle. Um, and they provide interesting winter interests throughout the, the winter season. So you may consider it for an area where you want to provide some winter interests as well. I have this growing in the garden right outside of my porch. Uh, it's an average garden soil. It's growing underneath a shrub. Uh, it tolerates the afternoon sun, uh, which it gets quite a lot of, uh, and it's just really thriving beautifully. Virginia chain fern is not a species that we see quite often in New England, yet I have seen it in the mid-Atlantic a little bit more. Here's another great plant for those moist meadows uh, where you have a lot of soil moisture and a full open sunny setting. The Virginia chain fern or Woodwardia virginica does quite well in these settings and will spread 
manageably in uh, a wet meadow. Uh, it's quite a beautiful plant. It gets to be almost three feet tall um, and provides these beautiful uh, fronds that uh, arise in the garden. This plant will compete very well with other grasses and other wildflowers that you would typically find in a meadow. Bracken fern is another challenging species. Uh, this is one that we want to be careful where we plant it. I've seen this used very nicely underneath pine trees uh, where you get pitch pine perhaps with a sandier soil, a little bit more open canopy rather than under white pine, which tends to form a fairly dense canopy. The bracken fern, Pteridium aquilinum, uh, spreads by a pretty substantial rhizome. Uh, it can be quite aggressive in the garden, uh, but it's another great plant for naturalizing. If you've got a woodland and you want to establish some ferns uh, growing in the understory, the bracken fern is a good choice. Uh, this also grows quite well in open meadows. This one does not need a wet meadow. It grows very well in dry soils. You can see it mixed in here with Myanthemum canadense, the uh, Canada Mayflower, and also some, uh, looks like there's some Laurel uh, Calmia angustifolia, and also some uh, Epigea, the Mayflower here. Um, I'm guessing this is a fairly sandy site. Uh, with some spruce trees nearby, uh, yet uh, an open sunny location where all of these plants can thrive together. Do not plant bracken in your garden, uh, but you could certainly use it as a background plant if you've got a rough area behind your garden space and you would like to fill it in with something uh, that's a little bit more moderate in size. Um, bracken fern is typically found to be about two and a half to three feet tall, but I have seen it as tall as four feet. Uh, it can grow quite large in a, a sunny area. So don't plant it directly in your garden, but perhaps use it as a transition plant or a background plant for your garden or for natural life. Many of our ferns can be found tolerating this light shade situation. Uh, we have a lot of choices here. Most of the plants other than the rock garden species that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, most of the sun plants can tolerate at least some shade. Um, some tolerate quite a lot of shade. Uh, but light shade is a really average kind of condition, and we'll really find a lot of diversity of species in the uh, ferns from shade. Rock polypody, Polypodium virginianum, is a plant that likes to grow on boulders. Uh, you can see here that it's growing on, on a rock among the mosses. Uh, this plant gets to be about six inches tall. The fronds are about six inches in length. Uh, it's a great plant for, um, you know, rocky areas. If you've got a shaded portion of your rock garden, uh, this is a wonderful plant to use. I have been able to establish this in gravelly soils or sandy soils. So you don't just have to apply it to a rock. You may be able to establish this in, um, in your soils. Um, it prefers a thinner soil. Uh, perhaps a rock underneath the surface might be helpful to keep this plant uh, in a happy condition. The marsh fern, Philipterus palustris, uh, is another, very, another great fern to use for your, your garden. This one will tolerate moist soils, uh, but grows in average garden soils as well really like the texture of this fern. I think it's quite pretty in the garden. It gets to a height of about 12 inches and it spreads on a creeping, a long creeping rhizome. So the fronds are more than an inch apart as this plant grows through the soil. Uh, it is not an aggressive species. It tends to form small colonies. So it's a good plant for your garden choices. So we had talked earlier that uh, the sensitive fern has, is a dimorphic fern, having a separate vegetative and fertile frond. Uh, with the marsh fern, you can see that this fern also has two forms. They're not completely different, but our vegetative frond is this one to the right, uh, which tends to be a little bit broader uh, pinules, uh, broader leaf, and the, veg the fertile frond is this one to the left, uh, which has the narrower fronds. And what's actually happening here is that the pinna are curling underneath 
to accommodate the sori or spore cases. Uh, so it gives it a little bit more uh, uh, separated appearance to the fern. Um, these plants make a great uh, addition to the garden. I love their grayish stem. Um, they're interesting uh, in their texture and can be used quite easily in average soils. The red stem lady fern, Aetherium angustum, lady in red, is definitely one of my favorite species. Um, although the cultivar is called lady in red, I've grown many of these plants from spore uh, and they come up true to the form with these uh, nice red stalks and uh, fine textured foliage. Um, they're easy to grow uh, and easy to find. Uh, this plant is great in the garden. Uh, it's a little bit uh, finer and shorter than the straight species, Aetherium angustum, uh, yet it really will set off many plants quite well. This plant is beautiful when planted with white flowers or deep maroon flowers uh, because of the red stems. It really is, can be used as a specimen in the garden. Um, it's a, an upright rhizome forming vase-shaped plants throughout the garden. It does not creep a long distance before it sends up another, uh, another upright rhizome uh, for, or another plant. So you can really get a nice colony of these species growing in your garden. I love these deep red croziers. Uh, they're quite spectacular as they're arising. You can see this one with green trillium and white creeping phlox. Uh, this color is just gorgeous with um, the bright white flowers. Um, ferns tend to arise a little bit later than many of our spring wildflowers. So plants that have ferns that have interesting young stages, uh, the fiddleheads or croziers, are often quite nice with spring wildflowers. Um, they can really set off each other and provide great contrast. This is the lady fern. Uh, this one tends to be a little bit taller, where the red stem fern only grows to about 18 inches. The true lady fern will often get to be about two and a half feet um, and, and be quite uh, broad. Um, they have a, a nice arching habit to them. Uh, and very fine textured foliage. Uh, I love this plant in the garden. It's just as pretty as the red stem lady fern, but you don't get that color contrast. Uh, I like the fine texture of it. I think it blends very well with many different wildflower species, and it's a great plant to be able to use in your garden. Both of these ferns tolerate average soils and light shade. Um, they don't like to be in full sun. Uh, they'll get burned. Uh, and prefer the shaded locations to the sun. The lady fern has these scales that are found on the base of their stipe. Um, these are interesting as the fern is emerging uh, and provide interest throughout the season. Um, the stipe is, is quite unusual, although not being red in color, uh, it still has some, some characteristics that provide interest for your garden and blends Maidenhair fern is a plant that everyone should have in their garden. This is another one that's commonly found in the trade, uh, but I wanted to sort of focus on some of the characteristics that make it really special. This plant uh, is, is actually can be a little bit weedy if left for long periods of time in the garden, uh, but I love the, the redness of the, the stalk, the stipe, as this plant emerges in the spring. It gets this pale green foliage, uh, and then it emerges to a more open species with a black stipe. Um, the texture is just spectacular. This is considered a tripinnate fern, giving it this interesting fan-like appearance in the garden. Um, the, the, the frond spreads out into a wide circle uh, and just is, has a lot of great interest. Very tolerant species. Uh, maidenhair fern is found in limestone outcrops in the wild, yet in our gardens it will tolerate an average soil in some light shade. I have seen maidenhair fern grow in more sunny locations, but again, it does prefer to be in a lightly shaded to a deeply shaded area.
So again, very tolerant species, grows in a wide range of locations. But what an interesting texture and feel to this plant. I love the black stipes uh, that set off white flowers in the garden. Um, I think it makes a beautiful contrast for many of our garden plants. Uh, and it's really a worthy fern. And again, very easy to find in the trade. Ostrich fern, or Matuchia struthiopterus variety Pennsylvanica. This is the fiddlehead species. Um, this one is very interesting in its growth habit uh, because its blade, or uh, its frond, has the widest leaves close to the tip of the fern, uh, or the tip of the frond. So it gives it a feather-like appearance in the garden. You can see that it's an upright rhizome forming vase-shaped plants uh, that spread throughout the understory. Ostrich fern is often found in floodplains along rivers, uh, and that's where we would find it in the wild. Yet in your garden, it will tolerate an average soil. I have it growing everywhere from a uh, sort of wet, damp area, seasonally moist area, all the way up to the top of a, a slope in the shade. Uh, it does prefer full shade. Uh, it does prefer to be in an area uh, where it's getting uh, at least some moisture. Uh, so this is a fern that people pick as fiddleheads. It's not a problem if you wish to harvest some of your fiddleheads, but I strongly advise that you do not harvest all of the fiddleheads from a particular plant. Wait until your colony develops some substantial size to it, and then you can begin to harvest uh, some fiddleheads. Most ferns are able to regrow fronds uh, if one of them is damaged or, or cut off, uh, but they only have a limited number of, of fronds that they will put out in a season. So you want to be careful not to harvest all of one fern and just pick a few fiddleheads from each plant. I think this is really a beautiful fern that needs to be used more often. This is one that I'd like to see in the trade a lot more. Uh, this is the fag fragile fern, Cystopterus tenuous. This plant makes a great ground cover. Um, it's got a very fine texture. It's low growing. You can use it underneath a taller species. You can see it compared to the jack in the pulpit here. Uh, it is still below the flower of the jack. Um, it only grows to a height of about six to eight inches, and it's a short creeping rhizome forming dense colonies. Uh, but it forms them over a very slow period of time. The plant really needs to be established for a number of years to form a, a big colony. Uh, but you can allow it to creep under your taller perennials uh, and mix in with other species. I do have uh, creeping flocks growing through this colony as well. One of, the, one of the interesting characteristics of fragile fern is that it arises quite early in the spring. When we were talking about lady fern, we talked about how they, the ferns tend to arise a little bit later in the season. Well, that's not true with Cystopterus tenuous. This is one of the first ferns that emerge in the springtime. Beautiful chartreuse color to it. Really bright and, uh, you know, great plant for early emergence in the garden. Um, this one tends to fade sooner in the fall, so this one's not going to provide a lot of good cover in the fall time, and you may want wish to cut it back uh, before the end of the growing season. You can see it forms a nice dense co uh, cover. It gets to be a moderate green during the middle of the summer. I love the texture. I love the way this plant grows. And in this plant, in this picture, you can see the creeping flocks down below here, and the twin leaf Jeffersonia diphylla uh, over here. It's growing quite well with other. Uh, wildflower species. Uh, this is another one of my top uh, ferns. I, I don't say I have a favorite, I say I have a top ten. Um, and with fronds like these, who needs anemones? This is such a gorgeous plant in the garden. Uh, it's a great vase-shaped plant uh, forming a nice colony in your garden. Uh, it gets its name silvery glade fern because it's covered with a fine coating of white hairs. Uh, this plant is uh, three feet tall and grows in a wide range of locations. It likes 
uh, humusy soil all the way to sort of a gravelly soil. Uh, it needs average moisture and is very easy to get established. Uh, it makes a nice colony, it's fine textured, and of course it's got that silvery color. Here's silvery glade fern in a garden setting just after it has emerged. So you can see it's got that silvery sheen. It's got the bright green leaves in the early spring. Um, and again, ferns like this are arising probably in late May, early June. The male fern, Dryopteris felix moss, is a species that's quite interesting. In New England, it's almost considered rare Yet this is the plant of the Victorian fern era. When people were taking fern forays on the weekends and going out looking for unusual forms of ferns, the male fern is prone to uh, developing different forms when it grows in the wild. So this is the straight species uh, with a nice foliage, base-shaped fern, uh, yet you can find uh, roughly foliage or, um, you know, very thin pinna or different color uh, rachis on this fern. Um, there's a lot of varieties that come up in the, the trade. Uh, this is one that can be available um, in many nurseries and garden centers. Those forms, those interesting sports or uh, variations of this fern, tend to be from a species that was commonly found in Europe. This is a, a species that is found in a wide range of, of area throughout the world. Um, so whether or not there are truly different species between the rarer straight species New England plants and the, the, the plants from Europe um, is unknown at this time. Uh, yet this plant provides us with some, some interesting forms and is really a garden worthy specimen. It only reaches a height of about two feet um, and it's quite pretty in the garden. And especially if you want some interesting foliage textures and you're looking for something that's a little bit more diverse than a fern, uh, this could be a great species that you would want to investigate. Here are some of the different uh, species or the different forms that are available. Uh, one that's very upright, one with uh, almost parsley-like foliage, and one with a more sparing type of growth habit. Hart's tongue fern, or Splenium scolopendrium, is a species that I have found to be challenging to establish in the garden, yet very easy to grow. Uh, this also is a species that is found in a wide range of areas globally. Um, it's found in the United States and in New England, um, but there is also a slightly different uh, species that is found in Europe. Um, these plants tend to be marginally hardy, so I like to plant them in areas that are a little bit more prote protected um, or areas next to streams uh, where they might not get as, as cold and where it might not get as cold in the winter. Um, this is truly a plant that does not look like a fern. Uh, it's got a very nice blade. It's very shiny. Uh, you wouldn't su necessarily suspect that this species was a fern uh, if you came across it. Um, yet it's a great plant for our New England gardens. Um, the texture of the foliage is quite nice. The color of the foliage is beautiful. Uh, this plant is tolerant of rock gardens. It will grow in a semi-shade to deep shade location uh, and tolerates a wide range of soils from uh, fairly moist to uh, an average soil. Uh, an easy one to germinate from spore should you be interested in trying to grow ferns, this one germinates quite readily and is easy to grow up. <clears throat> the long beach fern is a really interesting texture and a great plant for the garden. Um, although this looks like a fairly large stand of it, uh, it takes a long time for the plant to reach this kind of mass or form this large of a colony. Um, this is a very slow to get established. Uh, it takes a couple of years for it really to take hold in your garden, but once it does, the foliage is quite beautiful. The long beach fern tends to have a longer frond uh, rather than a wide frond. Um, and you might be able to see in this picture that some of the 
the bottom foliage uh, tends to uh, shoot back away from the, the plane of the frond, uh, which is, makes it identifiable. Uh, like maidenhair fern, the texture of the species is just so interesting. Definitely a plant that's worth uh, putting in your garden. This one will grow in light shade, but also tolerates a very dense shade. Uh, here you see it growing underneath uh, white cedar, uh, yet I have grown this very well in average uh, garden soil and in average gardens uh, where they're getting some sunlight. Um, a really interesting plant and certainly one to seek out. This one's becoming a little bit more prominent in the trade. Uh, it's becoming a little bit easier to find, uh, but definitely worth seeking out uh, as you're looking for plants for the garden. The broad beech fern, uh, Pagopterus hexagonoptera, has a broader frond than long. Um, this one has a little bit different kind of texture to it, yet I love this fern very much. I think it's a great species for the garden. Um, it's, it's interesting in a different way than the long beech fern. Uh, this, this species also is slow to become established. It is a, a short creeping species um, that spreads very slowly through the garden. Uh, and you, it will really take a little bit of time for it to take over. Neither of these plants makes a really great understory or ground cover kind of uh, plant because they are slow uh, as slow moving. Uh, but really nice to establish as a clump in your garden uh, for some diversity of foliage and texture. Bronze holly fern is a rare species in Massachusetts, yet this one too is finding its way to the trade. Um, this one's really interesting um, because it's got gorgeous glossy foliage in the summertime and you can notice the stipes of these plants are covered with these dense golden hairs. Uh, this vase-shaped plant uh, is very easy to get established in a cool, moist bed uh, and really makes a great specimen plant. The plant is growing to a height of about two and a half feet um, and just is really quite stunning in the garden. One of the nice characteristics about it is these golden hairs or scales. And you can see on the fiddle head um, that they're quite dense. Um, it actually almost looks like an animal paw as this is arising in the springtime. You may want to consider planting this near a path or near the edge of a garden so that you can observe these early crozures as they're emerging in the springtime. Um, unlike many other species that are densely covered in scales in the early spring on their crozures, uh, this one really maintains that coverage throughout the year. And you can see that in this close-up photo of the vase um, as they really have those dense hairs all over the, the stipe. Goldie's fern, or Dryopteris goldiana, is one of our many wood ferns. Um, these tend to be larger uh, ferns that have a little bit more coarse texture to them. Um, these ferns are great as background plants. They're great as specimens. Uh, they can be used in many, many places in the garden uh, and are really wonderful to have uh, growing in, as a background species as well. Um, these plants for, also form a vase shape uh, and spread slowly uh, as upright rhizomes. And you can see here that uh, my maidenhair fern that has gotten away and become sort of weedy in my garden. Uh, this plant has been here for almost 30 years, uh, so if it becomes a weed after 30 years, I can understand that. Goldie's fern um, also uh, has you know, has a very glossy foliage to it. Um, it's got a little bit of shine to it. This one has scales on the, the crozier in the springtime, yet those scales tend to drop off and are not as prominent on the stipe of this plant during the summertime. <clears throat> so now we're going to really talk about ferns for deep shade. So I hope that you've noticed that as I've talked about some of these species, that they tolerate a wide range of uh, locations and will really do uh, very well in both uh, sun and shade, or uh, light shade and deep shade. Uh, marginal wood fern is another one of our Dryopteris species. This is Dryopteris marginalis. 
We see this quite commonly when we're taking walks in the woods, yet this is a spectacular garden plant. Uh, one of the things that's great about this plant is it's got the dense uh, scales that are found on the fiddleheads, uh, and those persist through the year. Yet this fern, after it has you know, lived its life in your garden through the season, uh, remains green almost until Christmas. Uh, the fronds remain somewhat upright, uh, and around mid-December to late December, the fronds stop, start to drop towards the, the surface of the soil and are not quite as prominent in the, in the winter garden. Yet they maintain this evergreen color, uh, which does provide some interest in your garden. The interrupted fern, another Dryopteris species, this is Dryopteris claytoniana, and you can see where it gets its name. Uh, this is a dimorphic fern having separate fertile and vegetative uh, pinna, uh, not fronds. Uh, and what makes it so spectacular is in the early spring you get these really interesting green, black to tan colored uh, pinna that are bearing the spores. Um, once the spores have uh, dehissed from these front, these pinna, uh, these these little pinnules will drop off, uh, and you'll actually have a space on your stipe. So it's interesting because they've got vegetative uh, pinnules, pinna at the base of the fern and at the tip of the fern, but in the middle they pro provide these uh, interesting fertile fronds uh, that are coming out on the plant. Dryopteris claytoniana prefers a moister soil um, and does quite well in very dense shade, uh, but they will tolerate an average soil. Uh, you tend to find this plant more towards the edge of wetlands or actually in wetlands. So if you've got a wet location, this is a great species for that. It's a tall fern getting to be about three and a half feet tall uh, and has a very coarse texture. So again, another plant maybe for a great background species or maybe for naturalizing in a moist area. Now the opposite end of that scale is the oak fern. Uh, Gymnocarpium dryopteris likes a moist soil as well, yet this plant is only about four inches in height. Uh, really a wonderful ground cover in very dense shade. Uh, it comes up through the leaves just fine. Uh, it's got uh, uh, black or gray uh, stipes uh, and rachis and uh, these beautiful, uh, soft, textured uh, pinna. Uh, this is also a tripinnate fern, having three main uh, branches where the, the pinules or the pinna arrive, arise, uh, and a great ground cover. This one um, is also slow to get established, yet very persistent in the shade garden. Cinnamon fern is a very common species. We see this quite often. So when we talk about wildlife, um, this is a wonderful fern for our songbirds. Uh, you can see the dense white hairs that cover the stipes of this plant. Um, it's almost woolly as it emerges. Uh, the fiddleheads are covered in these white hairs. The stalks uh, maintain these white hairs throughout the season. Uh, but I see many songbirds, nuthatches, chickadees, and our hummingbirds as well will fly to this plant and rub their beak up and down the stipe, collecting these hairs. Uh, they use them to line their nests. Uh, and frequently in areas of, of high cinnamon fern density, I find a lot of uh, bird nests with this uh, fuzz uh, lining the nest. Uh, so a very important characteristic of this. Uh, this is also a dimorphic fern, producing beautiful cinnamon-colored uh, fertile fronds as well as the deep green vegetative fronds. Uh, this plant is common in wetland areas, but will creep into an average garden soil. Uh, this one has a large fibrous rhizome um, and also does a great job in filtering water as it percolates into the soil. Um, so if you've got an area where there's a lot of runoff and some pollution, uh, these plants are really doing the job to clean the water by trapping those sediments and trapping uh, those pollutants as it runs off. Christmas fern is often found in dense shade, uh, but will tolerate a lighter shade condition as well. Uh, it's got, a, again, a very glossy foliage to it, uh, and this one also remains evergreen throughout the, 
the season. We don't typically call it an evergreen fern because these fronds do not persist from year to year, yet they remain green throughout the winter. It gets its name Christmas fern from the small boot-like shape of the pinules. Uh, you can see that each pinna has a kind of toe to it, um, and you can see that here, uh, where the uh, pinna has a little bit of shape to it. Uh, very easy fern to grow, very tolerant of a wide range of conditions, and a great plant for the garden. The netted chain fern, or Woodwardia areolata, uh, is an interesting species, having deep red crozures and young, pin, uh, young fronds uh, that turn to a, a light green color during the season. Uh, this is a wetland species and uh, common, commonly found in moist areas. Moist areas. Uh, this plant would be good for naturalizing in a, a wet to moist location. Uh, and it gets its name netted chain fern because the fern veins form a net-like pattern. Ferns for special places. Uh, this is a close-up of the Densadia punctilobula, the hay-scented fern. I wanted you to see the, the pretty white hairs and the very finely textured uh, divisions of the pinules, um, how beautiful they are. Uh, and overall, they make a really lovely texture. Again, not a plant for the garden, uh, but nice for naturalizing. Uh, here's that same photo that we saw earlier, only this is in fall with the beautiful yellow foliage. You can see that it's got a nice fall characteristic to it. And again, a great plant for naturalizing in difficult areas, but not a garden. This is New York fern, another fern that's quite similar to the hay-scented fern, another species that I have a love-hate relationship with. The New York fern does not get to be as tall as hay-scented fern growing only to about a foot, uh, maybe 15 inches in height, whereas the hay-scented fern will reach a good two feet, uh, sometimes taller. Uh, so this one's a little bit more low-growing, a great ground cover. Again, a very aggressive species and not one that I suggest for the garden. Yet if you want a nice fine texture ground cover, uh, something that's going to fill in and naturalize, what a wonderful species this is. Uh, this is uh, both hay-scented fern and the New York fern, Paratholiferus novaborosensis, are deer tolerant. The deer will not browse either of these species. So if you have a high deer density or have an area where the deer um, are a problem, this makes a great uh, understory plant or ground cover. I think this is a really interesting fern. This is one of my, uh, a plant that I have, you know, that I really like quite a lot. Uh, this one's quite interesting because it does not only reproduce by spore, it also reproduces by a bulblet, and I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, I have this under ferns for special places because this is one that you want to plant on a wall um, or on a fairly steep slope. You can see that it's got very long fronds that are, tend to be quite narrow um, but are very arching. So this is a great plant that cascades down a slope or over a wall. Uh, this plant was planted at the top of the wall and has, uh, has filled in through the, the whole slope of the wall um, and come up in, in various areas between the rocks. Um, the, stent, the stipe or rachis has a reddish color to it, um, and the, yet the fronds are quite narrow. Um, the texture is interesting, um, but I wouldn't say it was my favorite. In a flat garden or a level area, this tends to look a little bit floppy and messy, but on a wall or on a slope, it can really be quite a beautiful plant. Here's the bulblets uh, that get, gives this plant its name. Uh, you can see the sori, the little black dots on the bottom of the leaf. Uh, but these large green bulblets are another method of reproduction for the, the bulblet fern, Cystopterus bulbifera. Uh, the bulblets drop off the fronds and fall into the soil and then produce new plants. So this is sort of a, uh, a vegetative method for this plant to, uh, to spread uh, by dropping these little bulblets. Uh, the bulblets then form ferns. 
uh, very interesting characteristic of this species. Here's Polea atropurpurea, or the purple cliff break again. Um, this picture is taken in a very sunny location. You can see how dense uh, and close together the, the uh, fronds are. Um, again, growing in the crevice of a rock. Um, this is a good plant for the, the rock garden, uh, and it's a, a low-growing species, so it does very well with low-growing plants. Um, again, I love the purple uh, purple black rachis and the beautiful gray green foliage of this species. Other uh, rock garden species you might consider are the dwarf maidenhair fern. Uh, much like our average or our common maidenhair fern in New England, this one forms the same kind of uh, growth habit and growth pattern, yet this plant is six inches tall. Um, this is really a wonderful species for the rock garden. Uh, the dwarf maidenhair fern, Adiantum oluticum, variety subhumilum, prefers a more neutral soil. Uh, my trick with this plant is to use marble chips in the soil. I don't like the appearance of the white chips on the surface of the soil. I find it to be very unnatural. So I use those smaller marble chips and I dig them into the soil prior to planting uh, these plants. Uh, they like that additional limestone and will really thrive in the area. Um, they will not tolerate a more acidic soil. They just do not flourish the way they do in the limestone soils. So please keep that in mind as you are planting this species. Two other rock garden species that I think are really worth noting are the ebony spleenwort and the maidenhair spleenwort, a splenium platyneuron and a splenium trichomanes. The ebony spleenwort tends to be taller. It's got a black rachis and uh, sort of these boot-shaped pinules uh, or pinna that are growing up the stem. Uh, it likes to be in a, a rocky soil, but these prefer a very shaded location. You commonly find them uh, in, in denser shade. Maidenhair spleenwort tends to form uh, kind of a rosette um, structure where they're more the ferns, the fronds arch out from the center uh, and make a nice rosette in the garden. Uh, this is a very finely textured plant. It's quite beautiful. Neither one of these, well, the ebony spleenwort will get as tall as about 10 inches, uh, but tend to be fairly small in clusters. So although they're taller, uh, they, don't, they don't form an abundant, uh, an abundant number of, of fronds. The maidenhair spleenwort is probably only three or four inches tall, uh, yet will spread that six to ten inches uh, with their arching fronds. Walking fern, or Splenium rhizophyllum, is a really interesting species. Uh, this one is a must for rock surfaces. It does not grow well in the soil, and it produces long uh, triangular fronds and the tips of those fronds will touch the, the ground or touch the moss and start a new fern, uh, hence the common name walking fern. One plant will walk along uh, and form a colony. So all of these plants may be attached uh, or may be a result of one particular plant uh, that started growing in this area. Uh, challenging to get established in the garden, fairly easy to grow. Uh, these plants are quite beautiful um, and are not reaching more than one or two inches high, but are creeping along the surface of the rocks. Rattlesnake fern, or Botrychium virginianum, is kind of an interesting fern as well. This forms a tripinnate uh, frond, a single one, and from the center of that frond arises these fertile uh, fronds, the dimorphic portion of it, um, that are really quite stunning in the garden. Uh, the plant itself is about uh, 10 inches to the top of the, the leafy portion of the frond, and then maybe another 5 or 6 inches with the fertile portion of the frond. Uh, Botrychium are difficult to grow uh, from spore. They apparently need some special treatments that help them to germinate, um, but they're not too difficult to get established in the garden. This is another species that prefers a more neutral soil, uh, so adding some, uh, adding some limestone or some marble chips to the soil can be quite helpful when establishing this plant.
So one of the challenges of growing ferns or having ferns in your garden is uh, finding sources for these ferns. Uh, so I've given you some uh, mail order uh, locations where you can order ferns from, but I do encourage you to talk to your local nurserymen and talk to the people that you typically buy plants from. Uh, these plants are also available from, some of these plants are also available from the Sami Farms and Garden in the Woods in Framingham uh, if you wish to uh, go and look at the plants and purchase them there. Uh, these sources, these mail order sources are going to mail smaller, sp smaller ferns, uh, so be prepared to nurture them for a little while and grow them on. Remember that ferns are not difficult to grow and that there's a lot of opportunities to put them in your garden and you should enjoy the different textures and colors that ferns provide for us uh, and remember that they are an important part of our flora.